I'm Elizabeth Ellen Carter, and I'd like to talk to you about Nocturne. In her first posting as governess, Ella Montgomery discovers beautiful Blackheath Manor, hides family secrets and suppressed passions. Beautiful music in the dark of night draws Ella to the talented Thomas Walsley, brother of her employer, the Earl of Renthorpe. Grievously wounded in the Napoleonic Wars that killed his beloved twin brother, Thomas is held prisoner at Blackheath by more than just his blindness and scars. Fueled by a bitter jealousy, the Earl has ensured Thomas is only a memory, his name etched on a marble memorial in the Bedfordshire village graveyard. Drawn together by their love of music, Ella and Thomas begin a clandestine affair. But how far will the Earl go to keep his family secret? Book Lovers Unite! I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. We're recording this episode a little later than usual because our guest author happens to live in Australia. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a little bit of a time difference. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with historical romance author Elizabeth Ellen Carter. She became an author just a few years ago and has already become a notable writer. She's been nominated for multiple book awards, and prior to that, she ran an award-winning PR firm. So I'm really glad to have her on the show. And today, or tonight I should say, Elizabeth will be reading from her current novel entitled Nocturne. And it begins right now. Ella found herself momentarily without a voice. She rose from the chair slowly. The room was in complete blackness once she turned away from the fire. She hadn't appreciated how much light the dying coals had cast. Now with her back to it, she might have sworn she was completely alone, if not for the sound of him breathing and the rustle of fabric as he shifted position on the piano stool. In her mind's eye, she tried to recall the way to the door avoiding the furniture and the musical instruments. I I didn't mean to disturb you. I just wanted to hear you play, she said. Ella took another tentative step. Her hand brushed against the curved maple of the piano. She took another step forward, working her way around it. Don't go. She halted at his words. Stay, please. His voice, now so much closer as she stood near the instrument, held a note of expectancy. I shouldn't. Ella was conscious of the uncertainty in her voice. Her eyes had now adjusted to the darkened room. Against the gloom, she could see the vague silhouette of the man at the piano. His curly hair identified him as a Walsley. She recalled the portraits of the two young men in the entrance hall. He must have taken her long hesitation as acquiescence because he began to play again. Warm, resonant notes rose from the soundboard. It was a tune she did not recognize, beautiful, melodic, and dreamy in its form. Thank you. It's been a long time since I had anyone other than Mrs. Mellor to talk to, said Thomas Worsley, and he continued playing. He did not attempt to engage her in any further conversation, and for her part, Ella remained rooted to the spot, her right hand on the rim of the piano, the left across her stomach. You play beautifully, she said after a while, before grimacing to herself for uttering such an inanity. But her praise elicited from him a capriccio, a skillful showing off before he returned to his nocturne. How is it we never hear you play during the day? The melody stopped abruptly. You have met my brother, haven't you? Tell me, which of them were you in love with? Although hours had passed since, the violently spoken words seemed to echo through the room. Then they decayed in the drawing room, was silent once more. Do you play, Miss Montgomery? I do. Ella watched him move with great difficulty to the end of the stool. Would you care to play a duet? The screech of a night owl in the grounds disturbed the silence, and it was though a spell had been broken. Ella was conscious of being alone in a room with a man who was a stranger to her, But more than that, she was in the presence of the brother of her employer, a gentleman no less. This was most inappropriate. She shook her head in mute answer to his question. Miss Montgomery? It occurred to her that he couldn't see in the dark, so she gave voice to her answer. No, I I only wished. 
to hear me play, he said, echoing her first words to him. Thomas rose and Ella prepared to run, but he merely centred himself on the stool once more. It was you who opened the door to the drawing room last night, wasn't it? It was me, she confessed. Then I shall keep you captive for as long as it takes to play Beethoven again for you tonight, Miss Ella Montgomery. Then you shall be free, Thomas said, his voice heavy with self-deprecation. Return to your seat by the fire. Ella moved past him, back towards the chair, then stopped. How did you know I was here, she asked. Before, I mean. The room is dark and I was completely hidden in the chair. He began to play the familiar pianissimo C-sharp octave in the lower register and the higher hesitant triplet configuration that opened the sonata. There is more to what we perceive with just our eyes, Miss Montgomery. Thank you so much for joining me all the way from Queensland, Australia. Yeah, it's about what, a 15 hour time difference between us? Yes, yes. Um, it's already tomorrow in Australia. That's crazy when you think about it. It's such a big world. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So, okay, let's just jump right into it. Nocturne is quite a novel. It's technically a romance, yet it seems to have a little bit of everything. It's a historical period piece. It contains mystery, drama, action. How did the story even come about? I'm guessing you have somewhat of a musical background. Oh, I aspired to when I was very young, but uh, no, it's uh, my husband who's the musician in the family. The inspiration to the story was actually a project that he worked on with a friend of ours. Um, of course, in Australia, um, the First World War is quite significant to Australia um, and the way we see ourselves culturally. There's a uh, an aspect to the national character that we call the Anzac Spirit, and that stands for Australia New Zealand Army Corps, which was established during the uh, the First World War, and both Australia and New Zealand um, sent the highest number of of troops per population, mm -hmm. and. Late last year, my husband and a friend of ours was, um, was commissioned by the local RSL, which is the equivalent of the American Legion, to write a, a biography of all of those from this little district who served during the First World War. Oh, wow. And what is interesting about that particular memorial is it not only remembered the people who died during the Great War, but also those who served and came back, some of them with absolutely horrendous injuries. Mm -hmm. And reading some of those, I, I was really moved by um, the struggle that uh, some of those uh, men went through to come back into civilian life. So from that point, I thought I'd set my story a hundred years earlier at the end of the Napoleonic Wars mm -hmm. and the character of Thomas being blind, I wanted to explore um, through through music and the use of senses. So uh, I did have a great deal of fun with it. Is Nocturne, is it part of a series or is it a standalone book? It's a standalone. I had read a couple of Gothic romances and, and really liked the the heavy atmosphere um the the mystery overlay as um you follow along with the heroine in this particular case not being certain what's going on knowing that there's a, a secret um that that weighs down the particular house and seeing her explore that it was i really wanted to to get stuck into that mm -hmm. And I really do enjoy the way that you tell the story. It's very easy to get wrapped into the imagery of it, and especially the music portion. That's the part that resonated with me. And that's why I was wondering earlier if you actually had a background in music because you describe it so well. Um, only as an absolute fan. I did do piano lessons as a, a child, but... Oh. <laughs> One interesting thing that I discovered that Moonlight Sonata, which is a significant piece all the way through this, mm -hmm. um, is technically not a nocturne because that was identified as a musical form uh, a little later on. And it was actually an Irishman who is credited with developing the nocturne. 
Uh, he was a piano salesman <laughs> <laughs> who would travel around Europe and, uh, of course, demonstrating the, uh, the piano, which was uh, relatively new in the early 19th century. Mm-hmm. So um, that that was that was fun to explore from a historical point of view. I've actually played piano for I guess 22 years now. Moonlight Sonata was one of the first pieces I, I learned how to play. <laughs> um, oh, I've given myself goosebumps. It is, it's a beautiful piece of music. It is. It is. Would you mind just explain what a nocturne is? Nocturne has a, um, a a couple of different meanings. Um, not only is it the musical form, but it's it's also the fact that um, Thomas only plays at night. He's become a nocturnal creature because of his blindness. It really doesn't matter to him uh, that much when he plays, and in the end, it's become convenient um, for his brother who can ignore him during the uh, nighttime hours, uh, leaving him free to uh, to roam the house almost like a ghost. Okay, so that actually makes sense why you would name your book Nocturne, because Thomas himself being somewhat of a nocturnal creature. Yes. <laughs> and speaking of your characters, who is Ella Montgomery, really? I mean, we know she's the governess, but what is it that's drawing her into this darkness and the music and to the mystery that is Thomas himself? She's very lonely. Um, She's lost her father and she's been feeling rather lost. Her her father was was very, very dear to her. And now with his death, she has to go into service. And she she loves children. She loves music. But but really, she's still in mourning. It's obvious that you have a deep love for history, but what was it that made you want to write about the Napoleonic Wars specifically? I had earlier on had just finished a novel called Moonstone Conspiracy, which was set during the French Revolution. So my mind was already in that late Georgian early Regency era. And because of that, and of course, it was um, the... 200th anniversary of the Napoleonic Wars, mm. I just felt there was this really nice symmetry to bring all, bringing all of that together. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that was around like... Um, the Battle of Waterloo was 1815. Okay. I kind of have a fascination <laughs> with Napoleon as well. I was in Paris last summer and I actually got to visit the tomb of Napoleon. And you get really awestruck walking in there because one, his sarcophagus is just so huge And they did that purposely because they wanted people to kind of feel that humbleness, you know, to be in the presence of something greater than yourself. And then just the structure that he's housed in in general is just marvel and decorated with these angelic statues. It it just really leaves you awestricken. Well, what I find fascinating about Napoleon is um, here is one of of Britain's greatest foes, and and yet the British admired him greatly, mm-hmm. um, and and in a way had this recognition of what an incredible general he was. Yeah, I think I was reading somewhere that before you were a writer, you actually ran your own PR firm. I did, yes, um, and a lot of a lot of hard work. Um, I I realized that I I really love the creative aspect of. Um, coming up with a campaign, um, looking at um, the audience that you're trying to reach. One of the campaigns which won us uh, a local marketing award was for our uh, city council, and we had the most difficult brief of all. Find something that will engage teenage boys to make them behave in a way that's safe around stormwater sort of, okay, well, we know that teenage boys will not listen to adults. We know that teenage boys like adventure. Um, But there was an interesting bit of psychology that we'd read that one of the reasons why teenagers and teenage boys like horror stories is because it allows you to experience danger vicariously. So that's what we we did. Um, We turned the... 
um, dangers of stormwater drains into a um, an evil danger that lurks beneath the streets of the city and created a viral ad campaign that looked at uh, the stormwater safety campaign like a movie trailer. And uh, and that, that was great fun to put together. So how did you move from that into writing? Did you work with a lot of writers as well within the PR firm? Well, no, I, my background prior to that was journalism. So I, I was born to write. I remember spending uh, school holidays when I was about nine or 10 on my mother's typewriter writing adventure stories because I'd read everything that was in the house. I, I think falling into becoming a novelist was inevitable. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a similar story with uh, a lot of writers. It's just something that's, you know, it's just within you that eventually just bubbles its way to the surface, whether you want it to or not in some cases. Well, how did you become involved with Chapter One podcast? How, how was your passion evolved? Yeah, um, I did, my background is technical, um, but I've, I've been a writer for a long time. I was actually, I didn't realize I was a writer until I was around 30 years old. And then after I wrote my first book, it actually, from no effort of my own, really, it gained a small following and it told me, well, maybe I'm a writer and this is what I should be doing. And then once you kind of throw yourself out there and, you know, you start meeting people and you're trying to figure out new ways to promote yourself, um, that's when I started relying on my technical background, especially with the industry changing into, you know, a digital format. So there's a lot more that you can do on your own just with a laptop and a microphone, which is how the podcast came to be. And it was a great opportunity to promote not only myself, but a lot of the other authors that I meet as well, you know, it's like when you meet another author, you feel like you're all in the same club and you can talk about things and, you know, you want to help each other. The, the, the camaraderie of, of authors, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's, it's almost like somebody's opened the door and you're a member of the coolest club of the, on the planet. It's, it's terrific. And everyone's so nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. What's the writing industry like over there in Australia? I mean, I imagine it's similar across the world, but I mean, I'm sure there are nuances that, that make yours different. Um, I, I think you're right. I think there's a, a lot of it um, that is the same. What I find really interesting is you talk to people who come from a literary fiction bent, and sometimes you've got to wonder whether they actually enjoy what they do because they make it seem like so much hard work. Um, whereas uh, the romance writers of Australia... Uh, which is closely allied to the Romance Writers of America, um, is a fun, dynamic organisation. Um, and the authors have a, a lot of fun. And, and they're so supportive of one another too. Yeah, and I have so much respect, specifically for you romance authors, because I've tried to write one myself. <laughs> and for me, I find it difficult transferring just those complex and raw emotions onto page because they're, they're just so complex. How do you do it? Um, I always start with the notion that human nature is immutable. So it doesn't matter if it's um, yesterday, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, people live, love, laugh, the same as they've always done. The things that annoy us today annoyed people five centuries back. So once you realize that, and once you realize that um, finding that um, significant other, that that um, that person who is going to be with you for for life, who completes you, the the story unfolds quite naturally from that. Um, one of the things I do like to do is. In my novels, the couples tend to get together um, about halfway through the story because what I find interesting is not the acknowledgement of, of feelings, the I love you, oh, I love you too. Um, what really gives the happily ever after to me is seeing how our hero and heroine work together as a couple to, uh, to overcome their external circumstances. In the case of Ella and Thomas, um, it's their position in the household and the threat that Thomas's brother has over both of them in different ways. Seeing them work through that and come out the other side um, happier and stronger and more together 
to me is the essence of a great love story. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. And I've never thought of it from that perspective. You're absolutely right that what annoys us today (laughs) annoyed us centuries ago. (laughs) Uh, So would you have any advice for, you know, us would-be romance writers? Uh, I think know your hero and heroine and and know what drives them. Um, uh, What what are their strengths as a character? What are their uh, weaknesses? What what are they afraid of? And how do the two complement each other when they get together? Um, How do they become strong when the other is weak and, and vice versa? So in a nutshell, that would be that would be my advice. Okay, right on. A question that I wanted to ask you earlier. Thomas's brother, what's his problem? They don't seem like they're the closest brothers. <laughs> I'm guessing there must have been some serious history between those two. Oh, there, there is. And I'm just trying to think of what I can tell you without giving away spoilers. Um, there, there is a set of, of tragic circumstances that comes about for the Worsley family, um, which drives the the brothers apart. And and I guess the thing that motivates Thomas's brother is his insecurity. And um, that that in that insecurity with within himself and his role as Earl um, is is his driver. A little abuse of power there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Well, Elizabeth, it was really great having you on the show. I really enjoy talking with you. Where can readers find you and your stories online? Um, you can find me on Amazon, of course. But if you'd like to know all of the details, including my back catalog, my website is eecarter.com. And with that, We'll wrap up another episode. Thanks so much to Elizabeth, our special time traveling guest who is 15 hours ahead of us. And as always, thank you so much to our incredibly, amazingly supportive audience. If you guys have a question or a comment about the show, or you know an author who you think may be a good fit, let me know. Send an email to me at info at ch1podcast.com or connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook, loosely on the Twitter, somewhat on the Pinterest, and one of these days, I'm gonna have to set up a YouTube page. Yeah, I'll get right on that. Well, that's it for me. You guys stay awesome. Till next time.